Welcome students. Uh, this is chapter 7, uh, DNA structure and replication. Some of this information should be familiar to you from Bio 2 and others from biology at high school. Please do not be scared by the number of slides, 122. Most of these are triple spaced or they have figures that run on for many slides explaining a continuous process. There are three basic sections to this chapter. The first part talks about the history of how DNA was discovered and some experiments that go with that. The middle part talks about DNA replication. And the final part of the chapter has an analysis on technology for analyzing DNA. Let's get started with the first slide. So. DNA is the molecule of inheritance. If genetics is one thing, genetics is the study of DNA. So students should be familiar with the history of DNA, the structure of DNA, and how DNA can then be manipulated. As the biology of cells progressed in the 1700s and the 1800s with the advent of the microscope and other techniques, people knew certain facts about the molecule of inheritance before they knew that it was made from deoxyribonucleic acid. So five things were noted in the 1800s. First, that DNA was localized to the nucleus. Second, it was present in stable form in cells, so it didn't come and go. There was sufficient complexity in whatever structure was carrying information to be able to transmit that for controlling the behavior of cells and other creatures. Number four, the ability of this material to replicate itself and pass itself on to future generations of cells was noted. And lastly, um, whatever substance was being inherited had to be able to change over time. So DNA was considered, or this particular substance was considered to be mutable. The true chemical nature of DNA wasn't realized until late in the 1800s. At that time, Frederick Meischer isolated from white blood cells a substance he therefore called nucleon. So we give credit to this gentleman for naming the nucleus and also the acid within it, ribonucleic acid. 25 years or so later, Edmund Wilson first suggested in written form that DNA might be the molecule of inheritance. He observed that sperm and eggs each contributed this nuclear material towards reproduction. At the onset of the 20th century in 1900, Mendel's work was rediscovered by three scientists. A few years later, two other scientists independently described the relationship between chromosomes moving around inside cells into gametes, i.e. meiosis, and how information in the form of genes could be inherited. By 1920, scientific papers were recording DNA as the principal component of the nucleon that was discovered earlier. The chemistry of DNA was subsequently deciphered and it was determined through chemical analysis that DNA was actually a complex of various subunits, A's, C's, G's and T's held together by covalent bonds. But its physical structure was not known. Soon after, DNA joined the ranks of RNA, proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates as a possible contender to be the molecule of inheritance. Now, we should know from previous studies that all these molecules combined together, apart from water, are the major constituents of all living cells. So this was not a real epiphany. The first person to get real credit for a major experiment that tested the ability of DNA to possibly be the molecule of inheritance was Frederick Griffith. He was working on pneumonia and the bacteria that causes pneumonia in mice. 
He knew that pneumonia bacteria existed in two forms, illustrated here on this magnification of a Petri dish. We have the smooth colonies as well as the rough colonies. And it's important that this morphology of these bacterial colonies, which each consists of billions and billions of bacteria, should have a relationship with the virulence of the same organisms. In his case, the S designation meant that the surface of the bacteria itself was also smooth and was preventing the immune system of the mouse from capturing those cells. So those bacteria evaded the immune system and grew to a point that they killed the mice. The other strain, the rough strain, had the ability to be captured by the immune system of the mice and therefore neutralized, therefore causing no further illness. The difference between the smooth bacteria and the rough bacteria was a single gene mutation, and that mutation is able to supply an alternative gene that makes the rough bacteria smooth. The climax of Griffith's experiments came when he took the dangerous S-type bacteria, heated them up in a test tube so that they all died, and then he mixed them once they cooled down with some R strains, which were still alive. He took that concoction and injected it into mice. What happened is that the mice died. An autopsy on these mice revealed that their blood was teeming with bacteria, but not of the living R type, but with the dead S type. So we know that living things cannot come back to life. So what happened? These four sets of experiments are legendary in genetics as important milestones in determining that DNA was the molecule of inheritance. It's experiment number four that we just spoke about. And the conclusions that Griffith drew was that something in the solution in the test tube was transforming the R type of bacteria into the smooth type. And he called that substance the transformation factor. One of Griffith's major conclusions was that a substance was being released into the solution, causing the rough strain to become transformed. He did not identify what the substance was because he didn't have the technology at the time to deduce the exact nature of this substance. It wasn't until a little later when three other scientists who get credit for determining what this transformation factor was in the chemical sense. Avery, McLeod and McCarty are given credit for those experiments and they are illustrated here in this figure. So what they did, they took the extract from the heat-killed still bacteria, the S-type, and then they treated it with different reagents, each reagent designed to eat away at a different component believed to be the molecule of inheritance. So they would have digested for DNA, they would have digested for RNA, they would have digested for proteins, and then they would have digested for fats and sugars. And of course, they had controls to make the scientific experiments valid. And it turns out, whenever they removed lipids and sugars, there was no effect in reducing transformation. When they removed proteins, transformations still occurred. When they removed RNA, again, the bacteria were transformed into killer S type. But when they treated these extracts with DNAs, a substance designed to destroy DNA, only then were bacteria no longer transformed. So these three were the first to deduce that DNA was the molecule of inheritance from the chemical perspective. An additional experiment performed by Hershey and Chase in 1952 proved further that DNA was responsible for allowing bacteriophage, which are viruses of bacteria, to infect bacterial cells. In those experiments, they used radioactivity 
to label different chemical substances. We should know that proteins contain atoms of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, while two of the amino acids also contain sulfur. Thus, a large protein will by chance contain sulfur containing atoms. Conversely, DNA only contains phosphorus. It doesn't contain any sulfur. DNA does contain carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, but it doesn't contain any sulfur. Their experiments entailed growing phage in environments that contain both radioactive sulfur and radioactive phosphorus. And these substances were then followed using photographic film to see where they moved within bacterial infections. So they're used as a tracer. Any substance that's followed in biology is called a tracer. Hershey and Chase are famous for using a blender to remove the viruses from the surface of the bacterial cells. By doing this, they were able to follow which component of the virus was present inside the cell versus on the surface of the cell. And what they proved was very, very interesting. And that's illustrated here in figure 7.4. Every experiment they performed yielded the same result. The only material that was passing into the bacteria from the virus was radioactively labeled with phosphorus. They were never ever able to find the sulfur entering the bacteria. So they concluded that phosphorus, which is part of DNA, makes it so that DNA is the material that's passing from the virus into the bacteria, causing the bacteria then to become infected and produce new progeny viruses. A short period later, Rosalind Franklin identified the three-dimensional structure of DNA using x-rays. Watson and Crick were able to assimilate all the knowledge available at the time to come up with a structure of DNA. They modeled two strands of DNA running in opposite directions with the bases in the center forming complementary base pairs. That is the true nature of the DNA molecule as we know it today. We need to learn that DNA is made of building blocks. DNA can be enormous. Some of the chromosomes that we've come across are hundreds of millions of base pairs in length. Regardless, each molecule of DNA consists of a building block known as a nucleotide. There is something called the nucleoside, but we won't talk about that in this chapter. Each DNA building block consists of three parts, the nucleotide, a sugar, a phosphate, and one of four bases. The sugar is always going to be deoxyribose, because that's what DNA stands for. And that sugar has five carbon atoms. And those carbon atoms are very important because they are then used as a reference to refer to the orientation of the DNA itself. The nucleotide bases are always attached to the first carbon. A hydroxyl group is always attached to the third carbon. And then the phosphate is always attached to the fifth carbon. Thus, the building blocks of DNA exist as four different types of bricks. You have here the A brick, the G brick, the T brick, and the C brick. The only difference between these four is the base. So this makes this A, this makes this a G, a T, and a C. And we'll learn that in more detail later. But while you're looking at this figure, please look at the numbers on the sugar molecule. And those numbers are the most important thing. We can ignore the numbers on the base. They are not relevant to our understanding of DNA in this course. Some of the bases have a double ring, as in A and G, and the remaining two are composed of a single ring. This is important because we need to then label the types of ring 
with a scientific chemical name. So pyrimidines have a single ring and purines have a double ring. One may use this learning aid, pure as gold, to remember which ones are which. So pure stands for purine, A means adenine, G stands for guanine, and because gold is heavy, a gold will have a double ring compared to other substances like silver, which will have a single ring. So pure as gold is relating to this second statement. The number of phosphates attached to the nucleotide changes its name. So if it has a single phosphate, we call that deoxynucleotide monophosphate. And if it still has three phosphates, we call that a deoxynucleotide triphosphate. The latter is not part of a DNA molecule. The former is, and we'll see that later on in the course. In living systems, DNA can be built using the nucleotides through a process of polymerization. That means one nucleotide is physically attached to a neighboring nucleotide and the process continues. Inside cells, this is achieved by using enzymes. This is a particular enzyme that we must learn and it comes in many flavors, but it is in the same category. So these enzymes are called DNA polymerases because they polymerize subunits of DNA. What exactly does a DNA polymerase do? Well, the second sentence tells us. It forms a covalent bond known as a phosphodiester bond between the three primed hydroxyl group on one nucleotide building block and the five primed phosphate on the neighboring building block. And this process can continue indefinitely as long as the chemistry is available. Figure 7.6 illustrated here has two parts. The first part shows you a DNA molecule being built and part B shows you the next rung being added to the polymerization step. All the information we've learned so far is in this figure. You can see how the hydroxyl group on the third carbon of the sugar will be then attached to the first phosphate of the incoming nucleotide. And these two phosphates, this pyrophosphate as it's known, inorganic pyrophosphate, will be released into the environment and then the phosphate group will be attached to the oxygen, forming the next nucleotide pair. Students should learn this in depth. However, we need to understand that these DNA polymerases, they operate under certain rules of chemistry and physics. So the first rule that you need to understand is that there are no DNA polymerases that can add a nucleotide to this side of the chain. So if you look at the chain, it has an orientation. So this side of the chain has a free hydroxyl group. This side of the chain has a free phosphate. So this side is attached to the fifth carbon on the sugar. So we call this the five prime end of DNA. And the other side has a hydroxyl group on the third carbon. And we call this the three primed end of the DNA. So this strand of DNA here has an orientation. And the opposite strand, the complementary strand, will have an orientation that's upside down or anti-parallel compared to this. So this will have a five primed end here as opposed to here. Thus, rule number one, DNA can only be made backwards with respect to the numbering system. So five, four, three, you will be reading backwards. So the three primed end would be the one that will be used to add a new nucleotide. And you can confirm this by looking here and seeing where the new base is coming in. And that would be rule number one. The second rule, not written on this slide, because I want you to listen to it, is that for DNA polymerases to do their job, they must have a template across a space. Without this template over here, this polymerization cannot take place. So we can see that the base opposite is a T. The polymerase will look at that and then bring in an A to be positioned opposite the T in the complementary base pairing rules. So that's rule number two. So rule number one is that you can only make DNA 
backwards. Rule number two is you must have a template. And rule number three is logical. You must have enough of these building blocks for the polymerase reaction to proceed. Two minor rules are that when you finish making the DNA, the base pairs will be complementary because of rule number two. And the two strands will be anti-parallel because of the way that the two complementary base pairs fit together across that gap. The gap we're speaking about is the width of the DNA double helix. In order to maintain that width, the only way you can put bases together is to have one purine opposite a pyrimidine. Remember, purines have two rings and pyrimidines have one ring. So the total width permitted, if you go back to this figure, is three rings between the backbone of sugar and phosphate. So remember this, this is a phosphate, this is a sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. So the backbone of DNA carries no information because it's all made of repeating units of sugars and phosphates, which are all identical. And the same thing for the other strand. So the only difference are the, the base pairs that are formed in between. But the point we're trying to make here is that the width from this sugar to this sugar is going to be standard. Therefore, you can only squeeze in a pyrimidine and a purine. This is the pyrimidine, this is the purine, and the total number of rings is three. Same thing here, and the same thing will happen here once this A comes in, as indicated here. So that's a rule that has to be followed each time. The other thing is, when you put an A opposite a T, the way that the atoms line up, you get two hydrogen bonds, as indicated here where the cursor is. When you put a C with a G, the way the atoms of the bases are orientated in space, you will get three hydrogen bonds. So two hydrogen bonds between an A and a T, and three hydrogen bonds between a G and a C. And this is a steady fast rule. The textbook talks about DNA double helixes existing in three conformations. That's not that important to us. Suffice to say that the most common form of DNA is the B form. And the B form has a gap from one side of the molecule to the other, the width of two nanometers. So here it is. So from this backbone to the backbone on the other strand, it's two nanometers. And that width stays constant as you spin around the double helix. Further, the way the atoms are arranged and the twisting nature of the two anti-parallel strands imparts on DNA a gap between the backbone and the neighboring backbone. So here is the backbone and here's a neighboring backbone and we have this gap where we can see into the molecule we can see the bases. Now as you twist it around further this backbone and this backbone are further apart and here we can see more of the bases deep inside the molecule. So this is called the major groove and this is called the minor groove. The grooves are important when it comes to other information molecules like proteins interacting with the DNA. The A form of DNA is present very infrequently inside cells unless they are infected uh, by a virus. And we find this a lot in bacteriophage which infect, infect uh, bacterial cells. The Z form of DNA has been discovered quite recently present near transcription start sites and that's because DNA can be bent and folded by various factors as we'll see in a different chapter. Moving on to DNA replication. This is a very dynamic process where students need to learn a sequence of steps that are very timely. Since DNA replication evolved, we believe about three billion or so years ago, it hasn't really changed that much because it's a pretty successful manipulation of chemistry by biological things. But we do know that there are slight differences in the way that the process is initiated 
elongated and terminated between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and also between archaea and bacteria. Through scientific experimentation, we do know now that DNA replication follows three important parameters. The first is each strand of the DNA molecule remains intact. It doesn't fall apart or is not taken apart. But the two strands of the helix are separated. So each strand of the original DNA molecule, which we call the parental strand, serves as a template on which the new strand of DNA shall be built. Now, because the two strands of DNA are complementary in the parental molecule, when you separate something of that nature, you will actually end up making two copies, like a photocopier, of the original DNA molecule if everything goes to plan. And that's exactly what we need in order to give two daughter cells the exact same DNA as the parental cell. Over the course of history, three different models have been proposed by various scientists for the way that DNA could have been replicated before we discovered the truth. The first was the semi-conservative replication method, the one we just spoke about, where the two strands come apart in blue and each one acts as a template on which a red molecule is generated fresh. At the same time, there was a competing model called the conservation or the conservative replication model, which said that the original parental strand is kept as it is, and somehow a new DNA copy is made besides it. And that has never been seen in real life. At the same time, there was a dispersive replicative model proposed by some scientists. They said that the original model is dismantled, just like Lego is being removed from a model and reconstructed randomly into two separate molecules. And that also has never been seen. So this is the only way that DNA has been seen to be replicated in all living things is through the semi-conservative model. Meselson and Stahl conducted a very important experiment in the early days of DNA understanding to show that the semi-conservative method was in fact true. And their experiment involved using a radioactive form of nitrogen and seeing where that nitrogen ended up over the course of time. Another observation that we find that's very valid is that DNA replication begins in the middle of a molecule somewhere and proceeds in two directions, both directions towards the ends, if it's a linear chromosome, or around a circle from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock, if the chromosome, as in bacteria, is circular. The location on the chromosome at which DNA replication begins is called the origin of replication. Most bacteria have a single origin of replication, always positioned at 12 o'clock around their circular chromosome. However, eukaryotic chromosomes are far, far larger and a single origin of replication somewhere in the middle would not be sufficient to copy the DNA in a timely fashion. So what's happened over time is that eukaryotic chromosomes, which are linear, have acquired multiple origins of replication. Once a double helix of DNA is separated at the origin of replication, the process of copying DNA forms what we call a replication bubble. And a replication bubble can be seen in this figure here. So this was the original double-stranded DNA, the parental DNA. And within the bubble, we now have one strand of parental DNA and one newly made strand of DNA on both sides. And the bubble will begin to enlarge as the replication machine travels here in the easterly direction and here in the westerly direction. So each of those spots is called a replication fork. So each bubble, each, each um, DNA replication bubble has two replication forks. This will be called the right fork and this will be called the left fork. The two forks are identical other than being upside down 
compared to the first. Returning to illustrate the example in bacteria, if this was 12 o'clock, the origin of replication would be here, REI, and this would be the replication bubble at time very early. And then a couple of minutes later, the bubble would have enlarged and the replication forks would be traveling here, down this way, and on this side, opening up this helix and traveling that way. Eventually, if everything goes to plan, the two halves of the bubble, the two replication forks, would meet down here. And at that time, you would end up like this, two copies of the original parental DNA, and after you resolve this, that means you separate the two rings of DNA, the two molecules of DNA, i.e. the two chromosomes, you'll end up with one chromosome going one way and the other chromosome going the other way, then the cell will divide down the middle. How do we know experimentally that this is the case? Pulse chase labeling experiments performed in 1968 were able to demonstrate this in a graphical nature. And that is presented in this figure here. Students should take a few moments to try to decipher what's going on. Uh, this figure here is then replicated down here as a cartoon. So this was actual experimental data, and this is what's happening as a figure. Turning our attention to eukaryotes, eukaryotes, as I mentioned earlier, have huge chromosomes and somebody has calculated that on all the chromosomes inside a single nucleus of a human cell, when that cell wants to divide, the DNA separates at 50,000 different points, i.e. 50,000 different bubbles are formed simultaneously before DNA is replicated. Now DNA replication speeds, rates, they do vary in different types of cells. So liver cells compared to neurons, uh, they take different time periods. Neurons can take years to replicate uh, themselves, and their DNA is replicated over many, many days, if not weeks, whereas a white blood cell may replicate its DNA within a few hours. One may be asking what happens to these simultaneous bubbles as time passes, and that's illustrated in this figure here. So early on, we have separate bubbles moving and growing towards each other. And as time passes, they get closer and closer. And near the end, these, this bubble here will merge with this bubble. And this bubble over here in the middle will merge with this bubble on the right. And you would end up with two copies of the original chromosome using the semi-conservative DNA replication process. Most of our understanding about DNA replication originated in bacteria, specifically E. coli. So most of the notes that follow pertain to bacterial DNA replication. And any differences will be mentioned as necessary, as we just did with linear versus circular chromosomes. The process in bacteria involves the interplay of a bunch of different proteins some of these are enzymes, others are just proteins helping the process without catalyzing any chemical reactions. If you follow this figure according to the numbering system, you'll get a sequential idea of how things pan out over time as the replication fork grows towards the right-hand side. So we have a enzyme here, topoisomerase, its job is to relieve any tension that builds up in the DNA as a result of the helicase separating the two strands of DNA. So this is a very, very physical solution to separation of a twisted entity. Once the two strands are separated, in order to prevent them from coming back together again, these pink proteins are loaded onto both strands of DNA, and the pink proteins are called single-strand binding proteins. Then a RNA primer comes along and generates a tiny amount of RNA template. And then that template is used to extend 
the DNA in two different directions. And this is where the learning has to take place. And we'll do this over the subsequent set of slides. But from this point, if you already understand what's happening, you should be able to make your way all the way down to step seven and be able to relay that to another individual. Let's return to the beginning of the process where the bubble first begins to form. Bubbles cannot form replication bubbles. They cannot form randomly along the DNA. That is not permitted. So the same spot is chosen each time. And in the case of bacteria, as we mentioned earlier, they normally have one origin of replication. So that replication origin, which is the generic term, has a particular sequence. It's normally rich in A and T. Now that may ring a bell with you because earlier in this video, we mentioned that A and T base pairs only have two hydrogen bonds. So a region of the chromosome that's rich in A and T will require less energy to separate. So this is, a, again, a very physical um, outcome based on the chemistry and the thermodynamics. So that region is 245 base pairs in the case of E. coli. And it has a name because the original scientist named it as REC. REC. Now, when we dissect this 245 base pairs of DNA, we find that it exists in a conformation that looks like this. So the origin of replication has three very important slots on one side, which are 13 base pairs long. Therefore, they're called 13 MERS. And they're more or less identical. And then they are followed by four nine MERS. So slightly smaller sequences, but there's extra ones of those. This pattern is preserved across many, many strains of bacteria, even though there may be slight differences between one strain and another. So this red slide here indicates something that's new and is important to learn and that you will definitely be tested on this at some time. The other domain of prokaryotes, archaea, uh, they have slightly different organizations. Yes, they do have origins of replication, but they can vary from one to as many as four along their circular chromosomes. And in addition to that, they also have a different organization. They have these origin recognition bases that's what they're called because of the scientists that first discovered them. And they break down again into two types. The long origin recognition basis, which are about 25 to 30 nucleotides long on average, versus the mini origin, origin recognition basis, which are in the order of 12 to 13 base pairs in length. The best studied eukaryote it, with respect to DNA replication is the yeast, the brewer's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And that has been studied for many decades. And that also has multiple regions, origins of replication. And in that case, they're called something completely different, autonomously replicating sequences. Figure 716 illustrates a yeast autonomously replicating sequence region. Now that we know the structure of the DNA molecule at the origin of replication, let's now proceed to looking at the sequence of events which take place once a cell decides it's going to copy its DNA. So returning to E. coli, because we know the most about that bacterial system, we have discovered that proteins, particularly enzymes, are very important in initiating the replication bubble. Three very important proteins, which are handedly labeled A, B, and C, DNA A, DNA B, and DNA C. Uh, these proteins bind to the previously defined consensus sequences, the 13 MERS and the 9 MERS. And that's illustrated in this figure here. So the DNA A protein, it binds to the right-hand side at the 9 MERS. What it does, it pulls them together into a cylindrical structure like this, thereby causing a change in the configuration 
of the origin at the 13 mer repeats. And those are then stabilized by being coated with single strand binding protein that you can just barely see in the background. Then the system recruits DNA C and DNA B, and DNA B is somehow loaded around special sequences of DNA on each strand. So this strand of DNA at the top gets its own ring of uh, DNA B, and so does the strand of DNA at the bottom here, but facing in the opposite direction. And these rings have a name, they're called helicases. And that's another enzyme that has the ability to travel along the DNA, separating the two strands. This helicase will move over to the left, sorry, this helicase will move to the right, and this helicase, once it's ready, will start moving to the left. Now, one conundrum that life faces is this. Once you separate two strands of DNA into individual strands, you cannot use DNA polymerase because DNA polymerase needs a three primed end in order to continue to grow a new strand of DNA. So within the bubble, there are no free ends. Because think about it, if you take two ropes and you separate them, there is no third or fourth rope inside. You just have the two ropes that have been separated. So the solution that nature had to find very early on was to lay down a new piece of template opposite the parental strands. And that template is called primer. So uh, DNA polymerase can't do it. So another enzyme called RNA primer or RNA primase comes along and it can recognize the origin of replication and lay down a set of primers. And those primers can then be used by DNA polymerase to extend the template. And we'll see that in subsequent figures. That's the most important learning aspect of DNA. Once the primer has been laid down very quickly, another enzyme, the right one, this one here, DNA polymerase 3, comes along and it recognizes the three primed end of the primer, removes the primase and takes over and starts building the new strands of DNA. As we mentioned earlier, each bubble has two forks, a left fork and a right fork. At each fork, a collection of proteins materializes as well as nucleotides and new DNA strand synthesis. So that region at each fork is called a replication machine, which has now been relabeled as a replisome. So if somebody's asked you what a replisome is, it's a large collection of proteins found at each replication fork. The last component that students must learn is the labeling of the different entities present within a replication fork. So on one half of the replication fork, the top half say, on one side, the newly made strand will be called the, the leading strand. And on the bottom half, the newly made strand will be made in a discontinuous fashion, and that will be called the lagging strand. So in this case, animations and uh, graphics are the best way to learn this. So if you take this bubble here, you split it down the middle, the two halves will be identical, except one will be the inverse of the other. So you can just study one side, and the other side will be almost identical. You can see here, the top strand in blue acts as a template for this primer, and once the primer is laid down, this part where my cursor is will be the three primed end of that small blue segment. And that blue segment is RNA, that was laid down by primase. And then once DNA polymerase 3 comes along, it takes over and says thank you, and it starts growing in a continuous direction. And as this bubble begins to separate here, because of the action of the helicase, uh, the new strand of DNA, the daughter strand, will continue to just follow that for as long as it needs to, without stopping. The bottom strand, here, the template, that is 
is orientated in the opposite direction and it cannot be made forwards like this one therefore it has to be made backwards and each one of these fragments has to be then made independently for a short distance until the next segment of the fork opens up and then a new primer will be laid down here. So this is called the lagging strand and this is called the leading strand. You should note that as you grow this brown strand of new DNA, it will eventually come across the preceding RNA strand here in blue. And you can't have RNA left over in DNA. You can have it temporarily like this, but eventually it has to be removed. Unfortunately, DNA polymerase 3 is not very good at removing stuff in front of it. It simply can't handle it. So when it gets to this point, the enzyme falls off the replication machine and then it's replaced by another enzyme called DNA polymerase 1. And DNA polymerase 1 is pretty handy. It can remove stuff in front as well as make stuff behind. So it has this 5 to 3 exonuclease activity. That means in the front it can remove stuff and it still possesses the normal 5 to 3 polymerase activity behind. So the question is, why doesn't this enzyme do everything? The answer is, it doesn't like to stick around too much. It's very unreliable. So if you relied on, on this, that enzyme there to copy DNA, it would start and stop and fall off and delay everything. DNA polymerase 3 is a long distance traveler and a reliable one at that, whereas DNA polymerase 1 is a short distance performer. One last enzyme that's needed is DNA ligase, which seals these gaps together once the RNA has been cleared out. Without that, the DNA would never be joined into a continuous strand. So DNA ligase is a very important enzyme. Table 7.3 compares the three domains of life and their DNA polymerases. You can see that different terminology is used to refer to these because of the historical way that the scientific community analyzed independently the three domains of DNA replication. How about the nature of errors that are made when DNA is copied? That has been addressed by evolution to a large degree. The enzyme DNA polymerase 3, in the case of E. coli, has built into it a separate area, a separate active site, which is responsible for checking to make sure that the incoming base, the building block, the nucleotide, matches the one opposite in the template. If there is a error, the enzyme comes to a standstill and backs up and removes using the exonuclease activity that it's built into it to go backwards and remove a few nucleotides and then return to the forward direction. So this is called proofreading. And the rate at which errors are made in E. coli is once every billion nucleotides added. So this is amazing. The size of the enzyme and the size of the DNA molecule is nicely illustrated here in figures 721. And you can see how the proofreading activity and the exonuclease activity are separated uh, inside the core of the DNA polymerase. One challenge that nature had to address with linear chromosomes because of the way that DNA is chemically replicated is that as you approach the ends of chromosomes, you can complete one of the parental strands until the very last nucleotide, but the other strand you have to cause a premature termination because of the positioning of the RNA primer. And thus illustrated in figures such as this, the consequence is that every time you copy DNA, the strands at the end get shorter and shorter.
that may not be a problem for most of our cells because they have a safety net. They don't have any genes near the ends of the chromosomes, just in case the ends become shorter and shorter. Not all cells can afford to lose ends of their chromosomes, especially germ cells. Pretend that you want to have a child in the future, and if you pass on to that child shorter chromosomes, then what will happen is that the child will then pass on to your grandchildren even shorter chromosomes. And within a number of generations, the ends of the chromosomes will be so short that they will start losing genetic information. So nature has divided the body space into two compartments. Most of the cells don't have the need to replicate their ends. They just get shorter and shorter until the cell eventually dies. But germ cells, the ones that lead to the production of eggs and sperm, they have evolved a special gene that makes a special set of uh, proteins called telomerase. So telomerase is a ribonucleoprotein. That means it contains RNA as well as protein. It's an enzyme driven by RNA. What the RNA does, it helps to extend the ends of DNA so that the chromosomes don't get shorter. The mechanism may be hard to perceive first, but once you see it, it's quite simple. And we can uh, discuss this at a later point. Another conundrum that cells have to face, especially those with linear chromosomes, is that the ends of chromosomes are attacked by inherent enzymes that are present in the nucleus. These enzymes, their job is to identify viral DNA or any other harmful DNA that may exist and destroy it. So if the ends of the chromosomes are left intact, naked, they will be subject to the same type of attack. So the chromosomes of eukaryotes are twisted and bent at their ends and folded over to form structures. So the first structure that they form is called a knotted fold, a T-loop. And that T-loop is prevented from being digested by these very deadly enzymes by binding a protein complex that stabilizes the T-loop, and that's called shelter-in. Quite handy, shelter-in. If germ cells can turn on the genes for making telomerase, why can't other cells of the body be prevented from aging in a similar fashion. Unfortunately, we don't know enough about the process. We do know that in normal cells, somatic cells, that do become cancerous, one of the steps that the cancer cell does, it turns on telomerase so that it can extend its chromosomes and not suffer from a generation limiting um, reproductive process. So if cancer cells do it, why can't we do it in normal cells? Because we may turn our normal cells into cancer cells. Okay, moving on to the final part of the chapter to do with technology. The first process that the authors have decided to interrogate is called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. It's a method invented by humans to amplify DNA. So amplify means you take a small amount of DNA and then you make large quantities of it. Unfortunately, the PCR process has certain limitations, but we'll get to that in a few slides. Let's just talk about the process itself. Uh, Kerry Mullis, a scientist at UCLA, while on holiday in Yellowstone National Park, he started wondering how the bacteria can live at such high temperatures in the pools in the park. And he came up with the idea of using their enzymes at high temperatures to melt DNA of normal cells and to amplify using a cyclic fashion. So that revolutionized uh, the field of science and Mullis was awarded the Nobel Prize for his invention. The process is quite straightforward and can be performed in as little as half an hour these days. And it entails putting into a tiny tube or a capillary or even a DNA chip these days, 
a small amount of DNA that you want to amplify. Then you supply the ingredients, the building blocks of new DNA, the nucleotides that we spoke about earlier in the chapter. And then this special enzyme from these bacteria in the hot springs. And then two custom made regions of DNA that you have to get made by a company which are going to bind to the area of the DNA that you wish to amplify and the right chemical composition called a buffer. You put all these ingredients into a tiny little tube and then you cycle through different temperatures. Now the temperatures are mentioned here so you have a 95 degrees heating which separates the two strands of DNA called denaturization. Then you drop the temperature down to those that are recommended for your two primers called the annealing temperature and then you raise the temperature to 72 degrees where the enzyme is happy and that causes the maximum extension uh, from the primers along the template DNA. Then you repeat the process about 20 to 40 times. Figure 725 presents a very rudimentary perspective on PCR. So here's your original template. You heat it up to 96 degrees or so, and then you allow the primers, which are in dark blue, to bind using complementary base pairing that occurs naturally very fast. And then the enzyme comes along and captures the three primed ends of these primers, and it extends across this gap. You can see that in red. And this is uh, step number one. If you perform this again and again, what will happen is that the region between this primer here and this primer here will be amplified uh, millions, if not billions of times within that one hour interval. PCR doesn't work for every application. There are a couple of limitations. The first is that you have to design those two primers yourself. So you have to have some idea of the sequence at the ends of the target region. If you don't know that, then you can't design these primers. And the second thing is that there's a limit to how far the two primers can be along the DNA. So 15,000 base pairs is about the upper limit for most types of PCR, although recent advances can take that up to about 50,000. But even that is not that significant considering that a typical chromosome is 100 million base pairs. Another technique is called gel electrophoresis. In fact, you can take PCR products and then separate them or check their quality on a gel electrophoresis separation protocol. What we use here is a gel that shifts DNA according to size. So the smaller fragments can weave their way quickly through an electric field because DNA is negatively charged. However, the larger fragments, uh, they get tangled up in the matrix of the gel and they get hindered and therefore their progress uh, sl is slowed down and therefore the DNA is separated according to size. The next technology is to do with uh, DNA fingerprinting. So at different locations within our chromosomes, we have areas that vary in the population. Some, some people have a small number of repeats, other people have a large number of repeats of a simple DNA motif, like an ACC. So I may have 10 repeats, you may have 20 on one of your chromosomes, and seven on another that you got from your other parent. Regardless, those regions are called variable number of tandem repeats, or VNTLs and they're very useful. The power exists in their mathematical combination. So as it says here, if you have just four VNTRs in the population, i.e. four different varieties available on the chromosomes, you can generate individuals with 10 different genotypes in the population. So here is an indication of, say, you have this repeat, which is a 5 repeat, a 7, a 9, and a 12. That's all you have in the population, 5, 7, 9, and 12. 
because each individual carries two chromosomes, you could have any two of these. You could have two of these. You could have this one and this one, this one or that one, but you can't have more than two. So what are the, all the pos permutations and all the possibilities? Well, you can have two of one, you can have one of one and one of two, etc., etc. So therefore, with four variables, with four different VNTR alleles, you can have 10 different combinations or 10 different genotypes and they're indicated here. Why is that useful? Because then you can run gels from uh, families and figure out if these children came from these parents. Because the children must inherit these under 99.99% .99 of the time from their parents. Sometimes there's a mutation in the sperm or the egg of the parent and that can cause a adverse result. But those are very rare. So you can see here um, both parents, the mother and the father, they have these particular combinations. So the children have to have any combination, but they have to be present in the parents. So this one was given to this child from the father. If the fa father gave this one, then this one must have come from the mother. Likewise, pick uh, child number four. This band must have come from the mother. Therefore, the second band must come from the father. And the father has two bands, and this band must have been given to this child. So the, suppose there was a fifth child that had a band here and a band down here. Would that be feasible? Yes, the top band could have come from the father, and the bottom band could have come from the mother. How about a child with two number four bands, two bands in the same spot? Well, one band would have come from this father. The second band would have had to come from this mother. And she doesn't have a band of size four. Therefore, we would get suspicious about the, uh, the mother of that child. The next technology is DNA sequencing. How to decipher the order of the bases along a piece of DNA. Uh, this was initially invented in the 1970s by a couple of scientists. Unfortunately, uh, two of them don't get much credit because their techniques were cumbersome. But one of them, Sanger, uh, he gets most of the credit because his technique has now evolved into more modern sequencing technologies. And his methodology was called Sanger Dideoxy Sequencing. It's pretty cumbersome to understand. And the best way to relate to it is through videos and understanding the difference between these two molecules, these two nucleotides. So this one has the standard configuration that we find inside nucleic acids and the building blocks of those acids inside typical cells. This one here is made artificially um, in the lab. And you can see the only difference between the two is that the bottom one is missing an oxygen. And that is the most important part. Once the Sanger dideoxy sequencing methodology has been employed, you end up with a gel that has bands corresponding to the different bases in a pattern such as this. So the computer or the human eye simply reads this from one side to the other. So reading it from the bottom, you have A, A, T, G, C, G, C, T, G, C, A, T, etc. And that corresponds to the order of the basis on the original DNA. In the 1980s and 1990s, technology improved and the Sanger method became automated. Not only that, it became scaled down so that instead of doing these experiments in decent sized tubes in the lab, you could now perform the same experiments inside thin glass tubes called capillary tubes, which cost far less and were automated to use laser technology rather than radioactive isotopes for these experiments. Since then, at a faster and faster pace, new generations of DNA sequencing technologies have emerged, which are either piggybacked on Sanger dideoxy or completely new based on DNA chips and other more modern ways of doing things. So re quite 
Recently, a company in the UK invented a microchip that fits on the end of a cell phone, and that can sequence huge amounts of DNA in within a very short period of time. Thank you so much.